Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 542, and I'm the host of the show, Kyle Lansloan. Today is February 9th, 2024, and we have a lot of news to get through on today's show. You can help the show by sharing it. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute. We repost the show on the blog at antiwar.com. It can be found on YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey if you would like to watch the show. I post up all the articles that I'm talking about. Sometimes we got maps and things like that. I do have video, so if I'm uh, just talking to the camera, uh, you can see my face. So all that is available through the video version. If you like audio only, you really don't miss very much. And uh, that's how most people listen to the show. And it's up anywhere you could listen to audio podcasts. If there's somewhere new or there's some hiccup with you know, one of the feeds, feel free to send me a message. Best place to get a hold of me is on Twitter, but I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. On Twitter, I'm at Kyle Anzalone underscore. I've actually been picking up quite a bit of traction on Twitter. Uh, I've had a couple of my tweets get a lot of notice and a lot of attention. So head on over and make sure you follow me if you don't already. But if you do, uh, make sure you're retweeting my stuff, particularly the articles that I write and that I'm posting on Twitter as well as at the Institute. All right. Let's get into the news on today's show. Senate votes down $118 billion military aid and border bill. So as we discussed on the last show with Connor Freeman, what what was going on is the Senate and House for months have been working on this massive supplemental defense bill, and it's now ballooned to $118 billion. Initially, it was just for the wars in Ukraine the military buildup against China, military aid for Israel, and then border security. But now it's also included some additional funding for the war in Yemen, and I guess also Iraq and Syria, where uh, CENTCOM U.S. Central Command has spent, I, I guess they're running near out of funding. They've spent so much money to support the operations, but also the munitions used in these attacks need to be replaced and need to be paid for. And so Congress isn't going to declare war. They're not even going to pass an authorization for use of military force, but they will just give Biden a quite literal blank check, a hundred billion dollar check to fund all these wars and, and let him do what he wants, even if it embroils the U.S. and essentially a worldwide conflict. So the, the Senate voted against this bill, which was expected. Uh, it needed 60 to pass, 49 to 50. Only four Republicans voted in favor of the legislation and five Democrats voted against this. And of course, you hear a, a lot of talk about how, oh, these are, you know, um, congressmen voting against America or national security and things like that. What needs to happen right now is the Biden administration needs to have a very difficult talk with the Ukrainian government. They say, yeah, we, we told you we would support you for as long as it takes and give you as much as you need to expel Russia from Ukrainian territory. But let's be honest, that was never going to happen. We made a bad deal, but you knowingly accepted it. And here's the new deal going forward. We will do what we can to help you come to a negotiated settlement with Russia that allows Ukraine to keep as much of its territory as possible. However, we cannot, we cannot give you another $60 billion in aid. And there's this new piece out at the, the Washington Post, and I'll probably do a larger breakdown on it on the next show, because I also want to do a longer breakdown on the Tucker Carlson and uh, Vladimir Putin interview. I have watched some of it, but I didn't ha really have a chance to take notes. I was just more um, watching it as it came. I wasn't pausing and things like that to, to make notes for myself like I would for the show. So I I'm guessing either Monday or Wednesday next week, I will have a probably pretty full breakdown of that interview, as well as some other news coming out of Ukraine. But it appears that Ukrainians on the front lines in particular are not only short of equipment and ammunition, more importantly, they're short of men. So what are we going to give Ukraine $60 billion to do if they literally don't have the men to fight Russia? So after this failed, uh, the House Majority Leader, that's Chuck Schumer, declare that, okay, fine, Republicans don't like this bill. What we're going to do is we're going to strip about $20 billion out of it. That's all the border stuff. And we're just going to pass a supplemental aid package bill, which at least in some sense, at least it's all about a war bill now. And it's not this, you know, convoluted war plus immigration bill meant to try to entice everyone just enough to vote for it. 
Uh, so the Senate did vote to advance, but not pass. So I, I guess they voted to bring it to a floor, and it's unclear what's going to happen when it comes to a final vote. Uh, the debate will likely take days, as Senator Rand Paul, the Republican from Kentucky, is looking to slow down the process as much as possible. He said, I'll object to anything speeding up this rotten foreign spending bill's passage. So that's probably some good news. I think the bad news is while this is going on, the House is probably working on something that is going to look a lot more like the 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 immigration policy that the Republicans want, and then it's going to include an awful lot of aid. I think it'll probably be uh, over $120 billion because the House wants to give more aid to Israel than the Senate does. So I, I'm guessing the House is going to roll out some pretty big bill. bill. I'm not sure if it'll get passed uh, through the House I kind of think it will just because if the Republicans are willing to vote on it for the border reason, even if you lose the two or three Republicans who won't vote for the additional Ukraine and Israel aid, Massey, maybe Gosar, um, there's there's a few others that I could probably throw in there, like a Marjorie Taylor Greene or Laura Blorbert might, might, might be good, but they might also not on on this and, and so you know maybe you uh pick up a few of the more moderate democrats with all the ukraine aid and then it gets passed that's what that way that's that's kind of how i see this all unfolding at this point but it, it's still unclear and i guess the good news is is that it hasn't gotten passed yet although it, it feels like they're getting to the point where they're going to start calling it a crisis and then they're just going to shove something through and down our throats uh, which is really uh, unfortunate all right, next up here, this is from Dave DeCamp, Antiwar.com. Zelensky removes his top general, a move that's expected to backfire. So Ukrainian President Zelensky on Thursday said that he removed General Zelushny from his position as Ukraine's commander-in-chief, a move that is expected to backfire due to the general's popularity, both within the military and among Ukraine's civilian population. So, starting today, a new management team will take over the leadership of the armed forces of Ukraine. Zelensky said his evening address on Thursday. He is replacing Zelushny with Sariski, Ukraine's ground forces commander, who is said to be closer to the president. So, there was a lot of debate leading up to this as far as what was going on behind the scenes because Zelensky did announce that Zelushny was going to be fired on January 29th. And we are now October 8th or not October, February 8th is when he ends up getting fired. And so, you know, that's a, that's a long time for the president to, to fire somebody. And part of it is Zelushny is very popular and Zelensky really wanted him to remain a part of his administration now, you know, there's a lot of people speculating on to why this might have happened. A lot of the rumors were that the uh, intelligence chief of Ukraine was going to take over as the commander of forces. And maybe this represented Zelensky understanding the strategic position that Ukraine was in without enough troops, without enough equipment for the, the front lines. Uh, Ukraine would need to maybe cede a lot of territory, but then fight some kind of counterinsurgency. And so assuming the intelligence chief may be better for that. Also, as Ukraine loses territory, it's not just Russia that may have interest in Ukrainian territory. Uh, there's also a lot of Poles and a lot of Hungarians that live in Ukraine. And so who knows if you, Ukraine is becoming a rump state, if the get, na, government there is becoming more and more nationalistic. Maybe you have uh, sections of Ukraine looking to break off and join a, a country in Europe that they're more ethnically aligned with. And so that would also be a place where the intelligence chief being the commander of forces may be helpful. However, they you know hire the commander of the ground forces, which is interesting. I think this is going to mat backfire massively on Zelensky. I don't think Zelensky was doing this for strategic reasons. I think he made this decision for political reasons. And, and, that, and that was to try to marginalize Zelensky because he's more politically popular than Zelensky. Now, I think this is almost going to actually have the direct opposite effect of that. Up until this point for Ukraine, 
the war has not gone that bad. Now, a lot of Ukrainians have died, not, not trying to say that, but as far as the amount of territory that Ukraine lost, the amount of territory that they've retaken, and really leading up to the summer of counteroffenses of 2023, uh, you know, just militarily on the ground, how they matched up with the Russians wasn't that bad. And so this may be a really good time if you're Zelushny to stop being in a position of responsibility for what was going to happen. And look, he could probably argue that there was a lot of things that happened in the 2023 counteroffensive that he didn't want to do and that he was forced to do either by Ukraine's Western backers or Zelensky to minimize his responsibility for that. And so I think this is going to make Zelushny more, not less popular. All right. And then this, I just want to put in here. So Representative Elisa Stolkin says Pentagon warned Congress Ukraine defeat on horizon without more aid. Now, you know, Dr. Paul has talked about this, how leading up to the Iraq war and things like that, uh, the Pentagon would call together members of Congress and basically just try to scare their pants off to get them to give, you, you know, the administration or the Pentagon whatever they want. Um, but I, I think it's worth noting what the congressmen say when the Pentagon talks to him here, too, not that we necessarily should believe it. But so the, the representative posted on at, I went to the Pentagon today with several colleagues for a briefing on Ukraine and what will happen if we fail to support it militarily. It was the stark description of the states for both the U.S. and Ukraine should we fail to provide more military aid first it's no secret that ukraine is running out critical ammunition artillery shells to hold russian ground forces back and air and missiles defenses to knock down missiles russia uses to attack ukrainian civilians russia could break through the current front lines and capture more territory she said now this is in one case where the pentagon might be kind of accurate however there's this really misleading thing that, that I think is coming out here where the Americans are in particularly the U S government, Joe Biden, uh, the Pentagon, the political leadership, particularly of the Democrats are pretending that we just need to pass more money. The, the problem is that we don't have enough money. And I, I mean, it's not untrue that that is a part of the problem, but the other one is that there are no surplus artillery shells there they are running out of surplus air defenses and it's not just in the u.s it's among our european allies and so to say oh we just need to pass another 60 billion dollars to throw more money at this problem isn't necessarily true and you know, I really wonder how darkly, you know, some of the Pentagon, the military contractors are looking at this where they see Ukraine is about to fall. But if Congress passes this funding first, then this is billions of dollars in military fundings and billions of dollars for weapons that really don't have a direct destination, but do have a lot of funding behind them. So there could be a lot of corruption going on here. All right, now on to the war in Gaza, which is becoming just unbearably horrific. Netanyahu rejects Hamas counteroffer for hostage deal, insists on total victory. This day to camp February 7th. The Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has rejected a counteroffer from Hamas on a potential hostage deal, insisting he will settle for nothing less than total victory. According to Middle East Eye, Hamas proposed a 130-day ceasefire in three 45-day phases with the goal of reaching a permanent truce. During the first phase, Hamas will release all the women, non-military, children, elderly, and sick Israeli hostages that remain in Gaza. In exchange, Israel will release all Palestinian women, children, sick, and elderly prisoners over the age of 50 from Israeli prisons and an additional 1,500 Palestinian prisoners. Hamas wants Israel to withdraw from populated areas of Gaza and allow the Palestinians the freedom of movement inside the Strip. Now, while these seem like big ass, Israel has rounded up thousands of Palestinians since the start of this conflict. And so Israel has taken its own hostages. A lot of the people, just completely innocent Palestinian civilians, men, uh, young boys, you know, over the age of eight or 12, they're, they're just absolutely rounding them up in Gaza and the West Bank, subjecting them to cruel treatment that really 
amounts to torture in most cases. And so, I mean, it's, that seems like a big ass to all the prisoners, but you have to understand that if they're doing a prisoner swap for what's happened since October 7th, I don't think what the Palestinians are asking for there is an absurd ask. Additionally, if you look at the situation right now in Gaza, you have 1.5 to 1.7 million people crammed in Rafa. That is not sustainable. Uh, th there's not the infrastructure to support it. There's not enough infrastructure to ensure clean water, sanitation, things like this. And so now you have rampant outspread of disease, uh, particularly among young people. Hepatitis A is becoming a bigger problem. And it's just becoming more and more serious. Now, on top of the food problems, on top of the starvation shortages and everything else that people are struggling with, they need to be able to... You know, Gaza was already densely populated before this war, but now they force most of two thirds to three quarters of the Gaza population into one tiny city along the border with Egypt. And now they're going to start attacking that city. And so, you know, asking for Israel to pull out of Gaza City, Khan Yunus and other places, even if they're destroyed, even if there's not a lot of infrastructure there, at least allowing the Palestinians to spread out would give them some ability to combat some of the uh, diseases that are spreading around because of how tightly packed everyone is together. Now, Netanyahu has no interest of restarting talks either. This again from Day to Camp, this one February 8th, antiwar.com. Israel is backing off from Qatar and Egyptian mediated talks with Hamas after Prime Minister Netanyahu rejected the Palestinian group's last proposal, the Times of Israel report on Thursday. And I think this kind of goes to, to what I've been saying for some time. And I felt like Israel was essentially participating in the hostage talks, not to have anything to do with Hamas, but to drive the Americans along. I, I think Netanyahu felt like he needed to get to a certain point in this war, a certain point in his ethnic cleansing campaign, uh, before he completely broke off talks with the Palestinians, because the, the talks with the Palestinians were what was keeping the Americans invested. Now that Israel has 1.7 million Palestinians trapped in, in the border town with Rafa, the, you, you know, the, the Biden administration probably can't pull the plug fast enough to stop the genocide from happening. And, and I'm sure Netanyahu realizes it at this point and, and that he probably won't uh, that Biden probably inter isn't interested in pulling the plug, even if uh, Rafa turns into an absolute bloodbath, which it is looks like it's going to. So. I wrote this one on February 8th for anti uh, for the Libertarian Institute. Israeli troops to attack Rafa as the UN warns of large-scale loss of civilian life. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said he would order his troops to attack Rafa, a city in Gaza sheltering over 1 million internally displaced civilians. The situation in Gaza is already dire. The UN warns the attack could cause a massive loss of civilian life. Netanyahu declared Israeli troops would soon attack Rafa. The statement follows the Isla Israeli leader rejecting a ceasefire deal and hostage exchange, saying he would settle for nothing less than total victory. Jens Lark, a spokesperson for the UN Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs, said attacking the city that is sheltering over 1.5 million Palestinians may constitute war crimes. To be clear, intensified hostilities in Rafah in this situation could lead to large-scale loss of civilian life, and we must do everything possible within our power to avoid that, he warned. Palestinians living in Rafah are sheltering in tents. The people lack food and clean drinking water. Disease and starvation are spreading in the city. Gazans feel the assault has them waiting to be martyred. And that was a statement that uh, waiting to be martyred, waiting to die is a statement that I read from several different Palestinians uh, when asked by several different media outlets what they thought uh, that attacking Rafah would mean. Omar Shaki, the Israeli Palestinian director at Human Rights Watch expressed that Israeli attacks on the densely populated city will add to the 11,500 Israeli uh, children Israel has killed in Gaza over four months. Gaza is one of the most densely populated places on earth, and Rafa is now 
most densely populated place in Gaza. Any sort of military campaign or airstrikes would amplify the risk of disproportionate attacks, he stated. It is unclear where the Palestinians will go after Rafah is destroyed by the Israeli military. Tel Aviv has placed two-thirds of the Strip under evacuation orders. Outside Rafah, the area, other areas in Gaza deemed safe zones lack infrastructure to support the 2.3 million Palestinians living in the small enclave. Egypt has threatened to go to war if the Israeli military attempts to drive the Palestinians across the border. Bob Kitchen of the International Rescue Committee explained there was nowhere safe for the Palestinians to go. If they aren't killed in the fighting, Palestinian children, women, and men will be at risk of dying from starvation and disease. There will no longer be a safe area for Palestinians to go. Rafa is the last city in Gaza not devastated by the Israeli military operations. However, the is Israel conducted scores of strikes in the city on wednesday israeli strikes killed 13 people including two ch women and five children in rafa so i i mean it's just horrible and when you understand that israel is going to advance on rafa you understand that this has to be there's the, the, there's no other explanation for what's happening here then this is a genocide aimed at destroying the, the palestinian people all right. So next up, Congress attacks critical aid organization over baseless Israeli accusations. So the Israeli attack at this point is kind of two pronged. Prong one, of course, is the military operations in Gaza. Prong two is attacking UNRWA, the aid organization that is preventing the humanitarian crisis in Gaza from spreading beyond belief. So I wrote this one on February 7th for the Libertarian Institute. Congress and the White House are pushing the United Nations and its Palestinian aid agents are punishing the United Nations and its Palestinian aid agency over Israeli claims that some members of the UN Relief and Warts Agency, UNRWA, participate in the October 7th Hamas attack. Tel Aviv has failed to produce any evidence to back its claims. Still, Washington is stripping funding for the organization that is crucial to curbing the humanitarian crisis. In Gaza. In January, Israel accused a dozen UNRWA employees of taking part in a Hamas attack. Tel Aviv has not provided evidence for its claims and is refusing to produce an intelligence dossier it says contains evidence for the assertions. Secretary of State Antony Blinken accepted the Israeli allegations without proof and Washington suspended aid to UNRWA. Now, Congress is seeking to make those funding cuts permanent. The $118 billion supplemental defense bill that was defeated in the Senate on Wednesday included a section that prevents funds from going to UNRWA. In Section 614, the bill says, None of the funds appropriated by this act and prior acts making appropriations to the Department of State foreign operations and related programs may be made available for contribution grant or other payments to the United Nations Relief and Wurtz Agency, notwithstanding any other provisions of law. And so I'm not 100% sure if this is in the Senate bill that got moved forward. However, this is one of the most disgusting things that the U.S. government and, and Congress have ever done, especially as you have President Joe Biden and his press secretary out there running around claiming that we have to pass this bill for the Palestinian people, because this aid includes bill to Palestine, when in reality, this bill strips aid from the Palestinians. Sure, they may say that we are giving aid to Palestinians through this bill, and the bill even may appropriate fundings for the Palestinians, but if that funding can't go to UNRWA, the group that has hundreds of thousands of Palestinians sheltering in their overcrowded shelters in Gaza, right? They're, they're distributing and coordinating most of the aid distributions in Gaza. To say that the aid can't go through that group is essentially saying that the you're not going to give aid to the Palestinians in Gaza. So what Biden said, what Biden is doing is, is absolutely disgusting. And I know everybody, especially after the uh, results of his what classified material investigation became public and they said, Oh, we can't prosecute him because he can't even remember when he was vice president. 
one thing that Biden can take full responsibility for is his position on Israel. He has been a complete and total anti-Palestinian nut job for decades. You, you know, even there, there was a time in the 80s where he had a meeting with an Israeli prime minister and said, oh, well, I would kill more Palestinians. And I believe it was Begin left the meeting saying that this Joe Biden guy is a complete nut job and lunatic and bloodthirsty. Like the, the Israelis were turned off at how bloodthirsty Joe Biden is against the Palestinians. So, um, yeah, just absolutely horrible. So, uh, you know, bad to uh, aside from stripping out the aid to the Palestinians in this massive supplemental aid bill, a bipartisan group of 12 members of the House signed a letter calling for Secretary of State Andy Blinken to demand the resignation of. Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, who is the head of the United Nations, and UNWAR Commissioner General Felipe Lanzare. Um, this is what the letter said. The most recent and appalling revelations show that UNRWA employees not only supported but also actively participated as a part of the Hamas attack uh, October 7th terrorist attack. Therefore, we will ask you to demand Secretary General Gutierrez and Unwar Commissioner General Lanzari immediately resign from their post. Now, imagine this. You have uh, an attack on Israel on October 7th in, in horrific 700 civilians dead, hundreds of military personnel dead, uh, 36 children among the dead, 200 hostages taken, right? Like wh what Israel did there was horrific. But since Israel has killed at least 27,000 Palestinians, another 10,000 are missing and presumed dead under the rubble. Hundreds of thousands of children are in a state of famine. Hundreds of thousands of children are suffering from disease. No children in Gaza has gotten any education. The majority, almost the entire 2.3 million Palestinians have been displaced from their homes. Most of the structures in Gaza have been destroyed by the Israelis. They are destroying the farmlands, the greenhouses, the cemeteries. And then you are going to take a letter and express all of your outrage towards October 7th and demand people are resigning from their post for that while well, you have nothing, nothing to say about what Israel has done. It is absolutely disgusting and appalling. And on top of all of it, there's not even evidence for the Israeli allegations. And the Israelis have lied to the Americans time and time again since October 7th. Whether it was the tunnels under cemeteries in Gaza, the tunners, tunnels under the Al-Shifa hospital, the 40 beheaded babies, Babies. The mass rape claims, they all turn out to be lies. And on this one, CBS News, The Daily Beast, and UK Channel 4 all reviewed the Israeli claims and found that Tel Aviv presented no evidence to support the assertions. And so you had to ask yourself, why would they believe this? Well, maybe Representative Brian Mass, one of the signatories to the letter, served in the Israeli military and since October 7th, wore an an Israeli military uniform in the Capitol building and dismissed the killing of Palestinian babies saying there are no innocents in Gaza. So UNRWA is critical to preventing the spread of famine in Gaza. Even Tel Aviv is concerned that if the agency is shut down, the humanitarian crisis in the Strip will deteriorate to the point where Israel will be forced to end its military operations. That the famine will get so bad that so many babies will starve to death that they will have to stop their military operation. That's what the Israelis say about this. And the Americans are still stripping away the aid with no evidence whatsoever. And by the way, the, the, U.S. Um, White House press secretary woman, she's up there saying that the U.N. is going to hold an investigation that won't be concluded until March. And so if the U.N. investigates and they find that nothing happened, then the U.S. may think about unsuspending the aid to UNRWA. But by then, this new bill will get passed that will already say that they can't have aid. And it's just a ridiculous accusation of guilty until proven innocent. All right. Saudi Arabia rebukes U.S. comments on is Israel normalization. So I, I think post October 7th, it really has to set bad Saudi Arabia's plans to normalize ties with Israel, which I think they were actually interested in doing 
before October 7th. But just given the current political climate in the Middle East, I really don't think that's something that Saudi Arabia is going to look to do in the short term. Now, the Biden, this is very important to the Biden administration, though, because they have to have some kind of insane delusional unreality that they believe in where what is happening in Gaza is not a complete and total genocide. And that delusion is based around the fact that they are going to get Saudi Arabia to agree to normalize ties with Israel. And then those two parties will get together and rebuild the Gaza Strip. Israel is never going to allow Gaza to be rebuilt. The Saudis are never going to pay for it. And Look, if anybody is concerned about Islamic extremism, it seems like about the only way you could guarantee it forever is to make Saudi Arabia in charge of the rebuilding of the entire Gaza Strip. Um, th this policy is absolutely Looney Tunes. And fortunately, the Saudis, you know, it it's just not politically possible at this point for them to say that they're willing to negotiate uh, a normalization agreement with Israel and they're denouncing it. But I do think this is a part of like the, the Biden administration's larger plan for the Middle East, which is based in unreality and, and certainly won't come to fruition by the end of uh, the, this year, which is, you know, important for his reelection chances. All right. Next up here from Jason Ditz at Antiwar.com. Hezbollah, Israel, trade strikes along Lebanon border. Israel carried out drone strikes in the city of um, in southern Lebanon, reportedly badly wounding a Hezbollah commander and starting a string of tit-for-tat firefights with Hezbollah, which raises concerns about further escalation in the ongoing conflict at Israel's northern border. Hezbollah responded to the strikes with a flurry of rocket fire against northern Israel, saying it was retaliation for the Zionist aggression. The attacks targeted a pair of Israeli military bases at Mount Muron and N. Zitman, uh, and, you know, interesting here, Hezbollah has, I guess, figured out that if they use their guided anti-tank missiles, and so some of these missiles has a, have a range of well over a mile, uh, the, these guided anti-tank missiles, and fly pretty close to the surface, I guess they are very hard to shoot down with... Um, with the Iron Dome air defenses and things like that, they are intended to identify rockets and missiles and things that are flying far higher off of the ground. And so th this has presented a little bit of a problem for the Israelis on their northern border. Uh, Israel then carried out a second round of artillery strikes in response to the rocket fire and was quick to insist there weren't any reports of injuries. Israeli artillery general targeted Hezbollah and the source of the rocket fire. Mount Miron is the site of Israel's main strategic air base in the north of the country and has been a favorite target of Hezbollah, often badly damaging the site with anti-tank rockets. There were two attacks in January. All right, and then I want to mention this. So the U.S., again, has been trying to negotiate this deal to de-escalate tensions on Israel's northern border, and they want Hezbollah to withdraw from the uh, southern Lebanon border and north of the Latani River, which I think is about six miles away from the border, or, or at least maybe that's at one point where they want them to, to withdraw from behind. And the U.S. is saying that uh, Hezbollah needs to do this in coordination with the implementation of U.N. Resolution 1701. However, there are several parts of that U.N. Resolution that Israel is not abiding by. And Hezbollah and the Lebanese government now are saying that the U.S. needs to, you know, force Israel to participate in the full uh, 1701 UN resolution or else Hezbollah isn't going to withdraw from the border. And, you know, this is something that we have seen time and time again in the Biden administration and something that I, I mean, I've expressed tons of frustration about is that the Biden administration will put all these demands on countries that we don't like countries that have their own independent streak. And when those countries make 
relatively reasonable counter arguments about, okay, well, we would do this if you would get your ally to do this. The Biden administration refuses to have any difficult conversations with allies or friendly countries or anything like that and ask them to do anything. We can't get Israel to stop the genocide in Gaza. We can't get them to stop attacking southern Lebanon. And this is per provoking these larger and larger escalations. And so if the U.S. wants to get uh, has uh, Hezbollah to tone down on in northern Israel, then they're going to have to get Israel to not only roll back the war in Gaza, uh, but they really want, you know, this Hezbollah pushed back from the border and force the UN resolution 1701, which they have no plans of pressuring Israel to do anything. And so it's just all a huge mess. All right, this one from day to camp antiwar.com, February 7th. Israeli airstrikes kill several civilians in Gaza. Israel continues to bomb Syria with impunity and targeted the western Syria city of Homs with airstrikes that flattened a building in a residential neighborhood early Wednesday morning, killing several civilians. Syria Sana News Agency said a number of civilians were killed and injured but didn't specify how many. The aggression led to the martyrdom and injury of a number of civilians and some material losses to public and private property and this is just something that never gets mentioned in u.s media we always talk about these awful aggressor states that attack their neighbors well israel who has not been attacked by syria has bombed syria every other week for a decade now i mean probably over a decade i think it started around 2012 and it's just constantly carried out these attacks against syria killed I'm sure hundreds of civilians at, at this point in time called caused millions, if not tens of millions of dollars worth of damage to Syria and just constant violations of Syrian airspace. It really hurt the Syrian government's ability to fight against the Islamic state, uh, which, you know, has only contributed to more violence and death in Israel. All right, next up here, I wrote this one for the Institute on February 6th. Only three in 10 Americans were aware of U.S. troops in Syria prior to deadly attack. A recent poll of Americans found that only 30% were aware that U.S. troops were deployed in Syria before three U.S. soldiers were killed just across the border in Jordan. The results of the survey show Americans are generally unaware of the attacks against U.S. forces in Syria and the reason for the deployment. Defense Priorities commissioned YouGov to pull Americans from January 8th to 15th about the deployment of 900 U.S. troops in Syria. Three in ten Americans responded that they were aware U.S. troops were deployed to Syria. The three U.S. troops killed at the Tower 22 in Jordan were supporting a U.S. base in southern Syria. U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria have come under attack over 160 times from Shia militias that operate in the region. The YouGov poll found only a quarter of Americans were aware of the attacks that left scores of U.S. soldiers injured. The Shia militias say they are targeting American soldiers occupying Iraq and Syria with drones, rockets, and missiles because of the U.S. support for the ongoing genocide Israel is conducting in Gaza. The poll found that a majority of Americans are concerned about a larger war breaking out in the region because of the U.S. troop presence. The outcome may be playing out. In a response to the death of three members of the Georgia National Guard in Jordan, President Biden ordered a massive bombing operation in Iraq and Syria. The White House will not rule out hitting targets inside Iran and has pledged future strikes. And one of those strikes occurred after I wrote this article the day after the U.S. targeted a Shia militia commander in Baghdad, uh, the, the story I'll be talking about next. So President Biden has refused to reverse his unconditional support for Israel, even as his approval rating has dropped. An NBC poll released on Sunday found the president's approval rating is at the lowest of his term, 37%. Weighing on his approval is likely the war in Gaza. Only 29% of Americans approve of the way Biden has handled his support for the Israeli onslaught. All right, so now the drone attack. This from Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com. Iraq has repeated its call for an end to U.S. military presence following a U.S. drone strike in Baghdad that killed a senior member of Qatbli Hezbollah, a Shia militia that is part of the Iraq Security Forces. Iraqi military spokesperson said the U.S. conducted a blatant assassination through an airstrike in the heat of a residential neighborhood in 
the capital Baghdad, showing no regard for civilian lives or international law. He said that by launching the strike, the American forces jeopardizes the civilian civil peace, violate Iraqi sovereignty, and disregard for the safety and lives of our civilians. The U.S. international coalition based in Iraq is supposedly in the country to fight ISIS, but the presence is more about trying to counter Iranian influence. The spokesperson said the coalition's consistently deviates from the reasons and objects for and objectives for its presence in our territory. And of course, these Shia militias are very important in uh, the fight against the Islamic State. And actually in Iraq, we're allied with the U.S. in the fight against the Islamic State. The U.S. claims the commander they targeted was responsible for the attacks on U.S. troops. Since mid-October, U.S. troops bases in Iraq and Syria have come under attack over 160 times in response to President Biden's support for the Israeli slaughter in Gaza. A January 28th drone attack that killed three U.S. troops in Jordan led to the U.S. launching heavy airstrikes in Iraq and Syria last Friday that killed around 40 people. The Iraqi government has been opposed to all recent U.S. airstrikes in the country and has been calling for an end of the U.S. military presence for months now. The spokesperson said the latest drone strikes compel the Iraqi government more than ever to terminate the mission of this coalition, which has become a factor of instability. This also provoked some protests at the U.S. Embassy and in the green zone of Iraq, but it was shut down before those got uh, too, too serious. All right, a couple stories on Yemen before we wrap up here. Very important article here from Dave DeCamp. U.S. blots Yemen-Saudi peace deal. The U.S. is purposely blocking a Yemen peace deal that was negotiated between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia, the New York Times reported on Tuesday. The U.S. redesignation of the Houthis as a specifically designated global terrorist will block the payment of public sector workers living in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen who have gone without pay for years. The payment of civil workers has been a key demand of the Houthis and is the first phase of the peace deal. The Houthis has asked for the salaries to be paid using oil revenue that goes to the Saudi Bat Yemeni government, whose leaders are mainly based in Saudi Arabia. It is unclear if the Saudi side agreed to the Houthi demand or if they decided to pay the salaries using other means. The first phase of the peace deal would also fully open Yemen's airports and seaports that have been under blockade since 2015. Another aspect of the deal that will be complicated by the U.S. sanctions, which will go into effect later this month. A U.S. official told the Times that the U.S. will only allow the payment of Yemeni civil salaries if the Houthis choose to pass the peace and stop attacking shipping in the Red Sea. So it's amazing, right, that you could block a peace deal and then you could claim that the, the country, the Yemen, needs to follow the path of peace in order to have access to their peace deal or you're going to keep, keep bombing them. Now, the U.S. bombing of Yemen is accelerating. Uh, last one here. This from day to camp antiwar.com. U.S. launches more round of airstrikes against the Houthis in Yemen. So Dave initially wrote here, the U.S. launched two more rounds of missile strikes against targets in Yemen on Wednesday as the Houthis continue to target shipping in the Red Sea. But then Central Command said it launched seven more strikes throughout the day on February 8th. And so that's going to be Thursday. So, you know, we're, we're, we're conducting... A full-on war in Yemen at this point that is completely undeclared, completely without the support of Congress, and it's just unbelievably awful. Uh, Dave notes here that there's been, I guess now, about 28 rounds of airstrikes against Yemen since January 12th. So, eh, horrific. Uh, what the U.S. is doing and what Biden is getting away with. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning into the show today. We'll be back with more next week. Um if uh, you want to listen to more of my content, I was on Judge Andrew Napolitano show, Judging Freedom, on Thursday, and uh, I think I did a pretty good interview with him. I was also on Scott Horton's KPFK show, uh, so that should be coming out this weekend. And on Monday, I was on with Misty Winston, so you can find that interview at the archives of TNT Radio. Thanks, everyone.